there are ties between Meharry and Clark. As some of you know, the first class is taught to medical students at Meharry. We're taught in Clark Church. And so our two institutions are wedded in a very sp special way. Um, this is one of those subjects, man professing hope in the midst of despair, that evokes lots of thoughts in my mind. It causes me to tell you a story. So I grew up in rural Arkansas, and I lost my dad when I was 11 years old. And I was left in a house with four sisters and my mother, and I called an estrogen overload. <laughs> <laughs> and my next door neighbor, Mr. Lee Andrew Watson, did lots of things with me to give me some manly influence. One of the things he did was he took me hunting. And we hunted for deer and we hunted for other things, but we also hunted for squirrels. Mr. Watson called them chicken of the trees. <laughs> <laughs> and I was about 13 years old, I guess, and we'd go out and he would always come back with an animal or two. And at first, I could never, ever do this, okay? So I'm sitting on my mother's back porch one day thinking about, what in the world? I, I know I can, you know, I can aim and I can hold my breath and I can squeeze the trigger just right, but I couldn't do anything. Then it occurred to me that I had a Remington 22 caliber rifle. And Mr. Watson had a 12 gauge shotgun. <laughs> All you had to do was aim at the tree. <laughs> Whatever was in the tree, <laughs> it was coming down. <laughs> so I didn't feel too bad after that. I thought, you know, well, if he gave me the shot, then I could get the squirrels to But this is going to be one of those talks where there are a lot of ideas, little pebbles, and hopefully one of them will hit the mark. And there will be something of value here in these next 15 minutes. I have to say that I usually get talks with pieces of paper, so my lovely wife convinced me to try this little device thing here. So <laughs> if I lose my way, if I lose my place, just 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 uh, bear with me. So I'm not a Bible scholar, but there have been some passages that I've gone to in the Bible time and time again when I needed comfort and encouragement or solace. In the past four years, uh, living apart from Phyllis and being in a very stressful job, surrounded by people who didn't know or understand me, I've had some moments of despair. And the following passage is one that I've turned to time and time again. It's from the 40th chapter of Isaiah. Many of you probably know it. And it reads, starting at the 28th uh, verse, Has thou not known, has thou not heard, that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainted not, neither is weary. <clears throat> there is no searching of his understanding. He gives power to the faint. To them that have no might, he increases strength. Even the youth shall fall, shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But those that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. Yeah. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. So looking around the world today, it is easy to be overcome with a deep sense of despair. Global challenges abound. There's famine, genocide, pandemics, emerging infectious diseases. War seems to be unending in many places. And people have gone to great lengths to find reasons to hate each other and destroy each other. And the earth itself is struggling to support the burgeoning numbers of humans who occupy it. And let's be clear, climate change is real. Let's all be clear that humans are responsible for most of it. In just a short while, just a few years from now, there'll be 10 billion of us on this planet and it's not at all clear how we're going to feed all those mouths and how so many homes will be lit and how we're going to power all those innumerable devices and vehicles. At the national level, sources of despair are no less numerous 
especially if you look like me, if you're black. Mm -hmm. Every category of success, health, and well-being show that our race is at the lower end mm -hmm. of the spectrum. And if you're a black boy or man, reasons for despair are quite profound indeed. Black men have been demonized to the point that police officers have no compunction to shoot them down in the streets as if they were less than human. We, black men, are incarcerated at a rate much higher than any other group in the country and for that matter in the Western world. And it is now clear, if you don't mind me saying, that in most of those instances, or many of those instances, the verdicts themselves and the lengths of the sentences are driven by our black skin. The recent shooting of the nine black worshipers in Bible study in South Carolina, dramatically mm -hmm. illustrate the depth of hatred against blacks that are still in the hearts of many people. I hope you don't mind, I'm gonna keep it real this morning. <laughs> Every day, in subtle ways, and in some cases not so subtle ways, like the hanging of the Confederate flag on public buildings, we are reminded that we've come a long way, but we're not yet where we ought to be. Let me tell you, as a person who's traveled the world, you don't escape the hatred and bias because you're black, because to, depending on where you go, the hatred and bias will follow. I know. Tell me what I know. I mean, yes. I think. I've lived it. I've experienced it. So, how is it possible then to have hope in the face of despair? How can we cling to hope when all sides around us seem to indicate that there should be no hope? Well, I submit that we turn back a few pages in our history and think about our forebears for a moment who suffered the ultimate in despair and slavery. As of 2019, blacks will have been in the United States for 400 years, and more than 240 of those years as slaves. I've often thought that I personally would not be able to muster the strength, spiritual, emotional, and physical, that our forebears had. I've also asked myself a question that James Baldwin wrote, am I worthy of the suffering of the slaves mm -hmm. and countless others who came before me. Mm -hmm. Can I even call my despair despair when I compare it to what they lived through? Mm -hmm. So how did they do it? What was the source of their strength to allow them to deal with this? As I was working on my talk, my wife Phyllis, who is an accomplished scholar in her own right, brought to my attention the works of another scholar and theologian, Dr. James Cohn, of the Union Theological Seminary in New York. It turns out that he and I have many things in common, including growing up in rural southern Arkansas. In fact, our small towns are separated by just 17 miles. Dr. Cohn grew up in the segregated South, as I did. He became obsessed with the hypocrisy of Christianity in certain contexts. This has been the subject of numerous of his books and scholarly writings over the last few decades. He points out that in many ways, the United States, in terms of race relations, is like the Roman Empire in the time of Christ. Jesus was born a peasant. He came from a place that wasn't considered very important at all at the time. But he was the great leader who represented the weak and the powerless. And he was that great liberator. He was crucified and died for the oppressed. So in many ways, if you think about it, the only group of people in the totality of the American experience who can lay claim to religion based on the life of Christ are the black slaves, who, over a period of 240 years, built the infrastructure of the so-called greatest country in the world through involuntary servitude under some horrific conditions. And even after the Emancipation Proclamation, 
the oppression and persecution did not end. The slaves among all the peoples of our history could say as Job did, though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. They were able to do this because more than hope, they cleave to faith. Faith in Jesus and the redemptive power of the cross. They had faith that God would deliver them and set them free. So with respect to the program today, I would take the speaker's prerogative of changing it just a bit. From men professing hope in the midst of despair to transitioning from hope to faith so that we can transition from despair to joy. <laughs> now the distinction between hope and faith is rather important because hope by definition conveys that something could happen or something that you long for could be had. Okay, there's more than a little uncertainty associated with hope. Now mind you, there's nothing wrong with having hope if that's all you can have. But if you're a true believer, hope must be replaced by faith. The big difference is that through faith we can claim as certain things that others can only hope for. This is why the slaves endured. They didn't just hope for freedom. Through faith they knew that it would certainly come. So how can we, especially black men, move from hope to faith and hold on to faith and the cross in light of so much despair? What do we do with so many issues and problems? Where do we even begin? I just have a few thoughts to share with you. Let me add this disclaimer. I'm speaking as James Hilbert, the man, not James Hilbert, the president, or the scientist, or any of that other stuff. Can we agree on it? <laughs> All right. Okay. Let me share a few thoughts with you. For me, most importantly, we have to, as my advisor, Levi Watkins, taught me, challenge the assumptions, reject the stereotypes, stereotypes, and be unabashed in our love of self. Every day I witness black folks who try to run away from their blackness. <laughs> Is there no greater form of despair than to loathe one own, one's own self and one's culture? Oh my goodness. We cannot love others as Christ taught us to do we don't love ourselves. <laughs> and it's criminal, in my opinion, and I see it all the time, that we allow, allow some of our children to fall into that level of despair, of not loving themselves, not thinking themselves important. It's especially important that we teach young black boys to love themselves and to recognize that their lives matter. Yes. And if we don't do it, it's just not going to happen. Then, each of us must embrace the singular purpose of our lives and the uniqueness of who we are. It's awesome to me to know that of all the billions of human beings who've lived and are living, God made me unique. And more important than that, he actually knows my name. Yes. <laughs> I can call him up and we can have a conversation. All those billions of people who've lived and died and are living, he may be unique and he knows who I am. That's amazing to me. So, and I consider one of the greatest gifts that God has given me, that I've never ever wanted to be anyone or anything other than who and what I am. Amen. Now this frees me to fulfill my purpose and act through faith to be obedient to God's will. You can't be obedient to God's will if you don't acknowledge that he has a purpose for your life. And I believe that every one of us who has been put on this earth, God has a purpose for us. Next, and I'm going to apologize ahead of time for saying this, we need to find a way 
my people, to work together. Yeah. Yeah. To support each other. Yeah. And of all the people of different nationalities who have come to this country, just don't mind me saying, African Americans are probably the least cohesive. Yes. The result is economic disenfranchisement, weakened political power, and instability in some of our most important institutions, including higher education. I love the story in Mark, the second chapter, in which four men put a paralyzed friend onto a carpet. Each of them grabs the corner of the carpet and take him to Jesus to be healed. When they find that they can't get through the crowd to go through the door to get their friend to Jesus, they did an amazing thing. They climbed on the roof, Put a hole in the roof <laughs> and lowered the man down to where Jesus was. Right. Now, neither one of these four men likely could have done this on their own. But by sharing the burden and trusting the other three to do their part, they got the job done. My point is that we each have to grab our corner and trust that the rest of us will do our part. And if we did that, we could do some amazing things. Yes. So I'm just saying, grab your corner yeah. of the park. There are lots of corners. They're available to us. How about we grab them and we do our part? We can do some amazing things. Yes. So earlier, we spoke of the importance of knowing who we are, that is, children of God who created us. But we also need to remember what we are. We are, in fact, the manifestation of the faith and the suffering of the slave. Let me say that again. What we are, we are the manifestation of the faith and suffering of the slaves. No doubt they knew that freedom might not come for them, but they prayed and trusted that it would come for their children and their children's children. We are the answer to their prayers. Yes. Yes. We are the deliverance for which they endured unthinkable suffering, humiliation, and oppression. And the question of the day is whether we are worthy of their suffering and sacrifice. Can we deal with our small D despairs half as well as they dealt with their capital D despairs? In fact, are we even worthy of the more recent champions of our causes who died in the recent past? And this brings me to the words of one of my most favorite writers, Maya Angelou, in one of my favorite poems. Out of the huts of history's shame, I rise. Up from a past that's rooted in pain, I rise. I am a black ocean, leaping and wide, welling and swelling, I bear in the tide. Leaving behind nights of terror and fear, I rise into a daybreak that's wondrously clear, I rise. I am the hope and the dream of the slave. That's what she wants. She is so right. That's what we are. And as Malcolm X put it, the bill is due. It's time to pay up. That's what Brother Malcolm said. Now, the failure to remember who and what we are has led to a disturbing sense of entitlement. I'm just gonna keep it real. Every one of us here who's achieved anything in any field is beholden to the work, sacrifice, and suffer sufferings of another person in one form or another from the distant or recent past. I have a brother, Charles, who's 10 years older than me. And to be honest, he's the smartest one of, our, of, my, of the seven children my mother had. But I know for a fact that some of the opportunities I had would never be available to Charles because of the timing of his birth and his status as a black man. He was just born too soon. But 
but he's a brilliant man, and he's my brother. He's certainly the smartest of the seven of us. So every time I have a feeling that I'm feeling full of myself or feeling like I might give up or give in, I think about Charles and the countless others who came before me and what they might have done if they had the same opportunities I had. As James Weldon Johnson wrote in 1899, we have come over a way that with tears has been watered. We have come treading a path through the blood of the slaughter. That's what he's talking about. So this sense of entitlement needs to go away. Yeah. So I contend that we deal with our despair as our forebears do exemplifying the true meaning of the redemptive power of Jesus on the cross. As believers, we understand through faith that we, we've been made endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. It is faith that allows us to proclaim as written in Corinthians. We have trouble on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. And as for my personal story, because of Lucy May Hildreth's faith and love, I and my six siblings were poor, but not impoverished. And the whites in Camden segregated themselves from us, but they could not segregate us from the love of God. Yes. Faith is a powerful thing. So, in closing, I suggest that we move from hope to faith and remember always who and what we are. And let us pray that prayer that Brother Weldon wrote and taught us that's now part of our Black National Anthem. God of our weary years, God of our silent tears, Thou who has brought us thus far on the way. Thou who by thy might has brought us into the marvelous light. Keep us forever in thy path, we pray. Lest our feet stray from the place where we first met thee. Lest our hearts drunk with the wine of the world we forget thee. But shadow beneath thy hand, may we forever stand. Standing under God's shadow, there is no despair that we cannot overcome. Let us remember that powerful message that's in another one of my favorite scriptures that's kept me focused and able to deal with despair. Romans 8, 18. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Amen.